Hey everybody, this is Josh. And Carolyn. With Homesteading Family. And welcome to this week's Pantry Chat, Food for Thought. Yeah, I it, think we're at number 16. This is 16, yep. And today <laughs> we are going to be talking about milk animals on the homestead. That's right. And uh, some of our experiences and choices for milk animals. Mm -hmm. there, there's different choices and, um, and different solutions for different people. Yeah. So uh, we'll get into that in a few minutes. we got to cover a question, and but let's start with um, catching up here. What's going on? Ooh, what, what this is, you know, we're trying to survive the spring scramble here and uh, <laughs> we're surviving. We're surviving oh, well. Doing great. Working hard. But we're working great. hard. Doing really good and taking some time out for some fun. So, oh man, I went fishing with several of the kids last night. They, just right up the road. You and... went fishing for, I don't think you were gone for two hours and you guys came back with 12 trout. I would say 13 or 14, but you know, fish <laughs> well, stories sure. always grow. 14 trout, which <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> so anyways, trying to have some fun there. But I yeah. have been getting my cottage garden in. So, And that is, that's work and fun. It, that I mean, is a work. I think fun. it's all fun. It is. But. It is. It does require some labor, though, oh, right yeah. now. Yeah. But so you guys know you've seen the um, the main crop garden, which is going in, and that's a nice space. But and the cottage garden is a different space that's right out in front of the house, and it's got this amazing mixture of medicinal herbs, culinary herbs, food plants, cut flowers, uh, herbs for cosmetics. It just the list goes on and right. on. Right, so it's a it's a per, perennial garden compared to mostly mostly perennial, mostly predominantly actually, perennial. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's you close know, to the house. There's a lot of basil out there. I gotta say, I have five different types of basil. In, yeah, and that's all annual. <laughs> yeah, you've so. got a lot of annuals in there, but it's it's uh, it's foundation as a perennial right. garden. Mm -hmm. And um, we did. You saw the video on prepping the soil, turning the lawn into a space that's ready for all these starts that Carolyn did. Five hundred plus starts. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if all of those are going, making it in, but uh, wow. Not only are all of those going in, but I'm going to bring in some more on top of that. Wow. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. It's very, a very lot cool. of them. So, and, I, and I think you're doing a video next week on, on a talk about a this. I just filmed a video. After on, all the starts are in the right. ground. With a little tour on it and showing yeah. you guys the different plants that are in there and how I've kind of designed it, my des design ideas on it. So, um, Did you know that she's a permaculture designer, certified? <laughs> Two? He is too. <laughs> <laughs> so it's getting to come out right now and uh, use some of that. Yeah. And get to play with it. So you it's know, a lot you've of fun. I've been waiting for this for a lot of years. I have. And it's very exciting. Yeah, yeah, I do a lot with the medicinal herbs, and so it's just yeah. so much fun to get to actually be growing them in larger quantity. So. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? What have you been up to? Well, still, uh, we got uh, most, well, we got all the main crops seeded last Saturday. Mm -hmm. So that's great. That's, and in, that's a lot. still have some <laughs> mulching to finish and some uh, water system to put in before we're kind of into maintenance mode uh -huh. for a little break before harvest mode starts. Right. But that's good. So that's wrapping up. And I've uh, been working inside on getting your class out there. Ah, uh, yeah. She's, you know, we've got a class. Carolyn has a class, Herbal Medicine Cabinet Colts. Right. And she just launched a free workshop, right? right. Healthy Healing at Home. Yes. So I've been doing a lot of behind-the-scenes work on that, getting that out there. And if you guys haven't heard about that, the, the workshop is free. There is a discount to the class if you complete the free workshop. Mm -hmm. And so we'll put a link into that if you're just looking for some great knowledge on a healthy healing at yeah, home. Yeah, it's definitely really good. We're getting great feedback on the free training yeah. that just people are really having their eyes opened about how to approach um, health and being healthy at home and kind yeah. of taking... Uh, responsibility back for your own health. And I love and, your, yeah. your ladder concept, which you yeah. guys will just have to check out in the free class. But ladder that, that of health. Ladder yep. of health explains it so, so well yeah, and good. gives a good approach. Yeah, so, so you've been in there. That and um, prepping for the preservation kitchen. In our basement, right. we're going we're gonna to put in a kitchen, a preservation kitchen, specifically for uh, preserving everything yeah. from canning to drying to processing our meats. And that is going to this be based is, off our old kitchen. Yeah, we'll be able to get to use the same cabinets yeah. that were behind us because we're like that. We want to recycle things and reuse them, right? So we'll get <laughs> to stick those back in there. But this is really important because we have these massively huge preserving days in our house or processing days mm -hmm. if we're butchering or, we, you know, the guy's been hunting or something like that. And um, you're watching the raindrops. Uh, yeah, I think we might get a rain. You, you we, notice we that it's June. The barn. And I'm in a jacket yeah. and you're in a coat. Cooler day here. <laughs> but, um, you know, we have like 
13 people that we are feeding three meals a day out of our main kitchen, all homemade food. Yep. So when we have these massive preserving days, it can just really um, throw off the functioning of the house. And so we're really excited to have this second kitchen that can just handle huge amounts of processing happening at the same time and some filming. Yeah. So that'll be really exciting. So you guys are gonna see that start coming together. And I'm, and. Gonna, I'm gonna put a plug <laughs> in here. Um, we're on a timeline for this because Carolyn is filming, beginning the filming of right. her canning class. This is exciting. You guys have gonna been be the... asking for this. Yes, for the yes, for well, overall preservation. So this right. is gonna start with a water bath and pressure cooking canning class. It's gonna be like a master class. It's gonna be very, very good. Yeah. And so the kitchen is part of that having a better place both for ourselves to can and to produce this class. So that's coming out this summer and we have a wait list already up. We'll put the link mm -hmm. in the video description uh, so that you guys can sign up for that. If you get on that list, there's gonna be a bunch of goodies during the time of production, I've some sneak peeks, some freebies. The first of a video that's coming out only to the canning wait list. So you guys can jump over there. And we wanna remind you when you're on our email list, when we launch a product, you get the best price mm -hmm. so if you're at all interested in that uh, jump on there so that you know what's going on you get the freebies along the way and then if it is something you're interested in buying when it comes out you'll get the best deal okay um we gotta go inside we're gonna go inside so, we're gonna move into the bar i don't know if you can see but it's raining it's raining yeah the <laughs> computer and phone don't like this so um we're gonna step over we'll that way a few minutes and, and meet you back in a second be right back <laughs> Wow, I think we made it just in time. It really yeah, started raining. <laughs> really started coming down. All so. right. Um, all right, in the barn, and you ready to move Move on? Move on. Okay, question of the day is from Rosemary Schmidt, and Rosemary is asking about handling varmints, particularly the predatory kind, on the homestead. She says, can you do a segment on how you handle varmints such as coyotes or fox? We just lost about 13 lane Ooh, hens. Ouch, that's man, rough. that is rough. Yeah. And so um, we're not gonna do a full segment on it right now, but thought that was a great question this mm -hmm. time of year uh, for just a, a, a quickie on. And um, you know, our number one answer is going to be other animals, protection animals, yeah. dogs, dogs particularly. Yeah. Um, cats for smaller rodents. Dogs yeah. that are outside full time, and we like to keep a full male dog around because they yep. mark and yep. definitely set their territory and their boundaries. Now, not everybody can do that. There's challenges with that, but um, having other animals out there that are, you know, guarding the area well, is really helpful. Pr the presence, patrolling, marking, mm -hmm. and we live uh, in an area, both here in Idaho and before when we were in California, we lived in the mountains and had a lot of national forest around us. And so we've always had predators around here. We have, uh, you know, fox, coyotes, mountain lions, bear, wolves. We have all of those right in our proximity. Yeah. And we have for most of the last, um, you know, what, 12 years, 15 yeah. years. Mm -hmm. And good male outdoor dogs, um, do a lot they don't prevent everything no nope. and you may need more than one if you've got a lot of livestock you may need an lgd dog specifically livestock guardian dog that hangs out with you can do them so they hang out with your bird flocks mm -hmm. or your sheep um, but you would need in our opinion you at least need a one male dog that uh, will patrol your property he sense it he, mm -hmm. he you know he he, yeah. he claims it and we have a couple now and they patrol they roam around and we have had surprisingly little issues for being in areas of high predatory they do happen and and for us it's been mountain lion in, in our couple different problem. locations yeah. that that uh, still come in sometimes um but just their presence does a lot yeah, yeah. absolutely i think that's been major for us yeah. it's been the best thing for us um, I just, I don't want to go off on this very long, but if you get into livestock guardian dogs, please make sure you know what you're doing because I know more stories from people who have had bad experiences with them turning on their own animals than I think I know of good stories. And that has to do with the training. It just really does. Well, and a, and a, and a livestock guardian dog is not a pet. It can't be a pet. Honestly, it's really. not a pet. And yeah. um, he has a specific function yeah you know our dogs our male dogs are semi pets but our our outdoor male dog he's an outdoor dog he does not come inside yep uh, he loves being with the family he also he looks over the kids when they camp outside he goes with them when they hike he goes with them 
but he's an outdoor dog mm -hmm. and and with that uh that's his life and so he patrols and he mm -hmm. is the maleness of a dog yeah livestock guardian dog is even a more uh, specific purpose mm -hmm. and yes you, you need to know you need to get educated on how to work with them yeah they can work and really really well you just have to know what you we doing. haven't done those we no. may have to in this location as we get our sheep flock going and other small animals that are going to be further away yeah um we may end up needing to do that in the mm -hmm. future now for smaller varmints you know you need cats too cats will take Absolutely. care of voles and moles and gophers mm -hmm. and squirrels mm -hmm. and so having barn cats farm cats those two are very very important to us yeah they are absolutely essential on the homestead and they don't take care of everything but they take care of a lot and we've had move into a place there's a lot of gophers and within a few years um the gopher problem is almost nil right because yeah. of cats we've yeah. got uh clover the cat in her cast over here and her three kittens if you guys didn't catch that story last week about poor clover and her leg um <laughs> go back and watch that pantry chat but we've got them running around the barn here as we speak and they're just doing a great job taking down the rodent population here in the barn yeah Absolutely. Good. So we there's, better move there's that on. tip. We better move on. <laughs> and so getting on to dairy animals. Dairy animals. Milking animals on the homestead. And yeah. this is going to be just kind of a quick uh, tour of our assessment of different animals and the choice we've made for our family, what works, and um, just some of the things we know and do to wow. make dairying work. It's, I don't know if you guys can hear it on the microphone. It's getting loud, but that is the rain hitting the tin ro the roof above us. And uh, it's fun. That is a country sound. Isn't and it's, it? it's very nice. We, yeah. we need the rain. It's we nice do. to have some. It's been a dry spring, dry colder spring. So yeah. this is great. Really good. <laughs> it's but, getting louder though. <laughs> but getting into okay. uh, dairying. Mm -hmm. So most of you guys that are hanging out with us know we have dairy cow. Yep. And the dairy cow is an essential part of our homestead at this point in time with the size of our family and everything mm -hmm. we do. But let's back up a little bit in decision making about it. So you think you want a dairy animal, mm -hmm. what's the way to go? Is it just a cow or are there other options? Yeah. Well, and there's definitely other options. Definitely right? other options. Definitely yep. other options. And the main ones that you hear about are a cow or a goat. Right. So those are the main ones, but there are even more than that. You know, in different parts of the world, there's a lot of different animals. You've got- Do you know what the number one milk animal in the world is no. based based on numbers amount of animals milk can you guys take a second and guess okay. throw, throw it in the feed if you can i'm curious <laughs> but <laughs> you, the, the, you don't know i i could take a guess but i don't know that i know take a guess is it a water buffalo water buffalo it is absolutely a water, buffalo. water buffalo is the number one milk animal <laughs> in the world not in america but in the world that yeah. is amazing yeah. well i'm gonna i'm gonna, I'm gonna milk a my, water buffalo one day i think that would be fun to see <laughs> that was not on my list of ones that were uh regular options around here in the United States. But <laughs> and if you're milking a water buffalo, please, please tell send us. us a photo because right, we would yeah, really like to share yeah. that. But um, another one that is actually very viable and that we have done is sheep, dairy sheep. And we'll get into that in a minute. We'll talk about the different ones. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Why would you go with a cow? Uh, why would you go with a cow? Well, volume. Yeah. And the ability to make butter. Yeah, the cream separation. Yep. Two, yep. two of your uh, primaries. Mm -hmm. Though, they do make butter out of sheep milk. They do make butter I've, out of sheep milk. I've had You've it. have had it. You I've had it. had it made traditionally, traditionally made. in Jordan. Yeah. Yeah. Very, and it was very, cool. very good. And I had no idea you could do that. I've yeah. always thought that you can't make butter. But anyways, that's a yeah, neat side story. Good, yeah. <laughs> so, um... A lot of families, though, let's talk about goats and cows, because that's okay. for, for us in the United States, that's the primary option. Right. And so our size family and our love of butter requires a dairy cow, <laughs> uh, a cow. We like butter. <laughs> but a lot of folks definitely have some um, milk issues. Yes. Allergies and tolerances. Mm -hmm. And a lot of folks don't need a dairy cow. It's definitely a resource. She consumes a lot, you know, and she'll produce a lot. And a lot of she folks don't need that. She needs a lot of land. That. You know, there's yeah. a lot more land. There's more land, more space. More, yeah. She's bigger to handle. Takes mm -hmm. takes a little more knowledge and and skill to handle. So goats yeah. are a fantastic option, even though we don't do goats. Um, I think we've got a couple kids that are interested, so we might someday so we might love some good goat cheese. Yeah. So, but for a lot of you, goats are a great solution for smaller scale 
dairy production. So we have a pretty high producing Jersey cow right now, Molly, and we are getting about six gallons a day at the moment, and that's with the calf on. Sorry about that. So the calf is drinking her share of the milk, mm -hmm. and then we're still getting six gallons a day. So you can see that's gonna add up, I mean, you do the math, that means 12 gallons in your fridge in two days and you know 18 gallons in three days that adds up really really quickly and will overtake you in a matter of days if you're not ready the, to you have to have up. a whole system it, of storage processing of for that now you do have options about how to milk to drop that amount down you can go to once a day milking mm -hmm. um, we we do that usually every year we spend a portion of the year when the grass is real green and really healthy doing twice a day milking and really building up our supply of cheeses and butters and things like that in the freezer. And then um, we'll drop back down to once a day milking just to make it a little easier on the family and just have some fresh milk to drink. Mm -hmm. And then eventually we'll taper off for the rest of the year. But so there is ways to control the amount, but that is a large amount. And that might be one of the real negatives for some people. For other people, it's a real benefit. Yeah. Definitely. Depends on what your needs are mm -hmm. and what your resources are. So just to back up and recap, because we'll dive into the dairy, to the cow just a little bit okay. more. So you've got goats. Goats are the go-to for smaller mm -hmm. families, smaller homesteads, don't right. have the space, and that is a great, great option. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned sheep, which is also a great option, but you're going to have a hard time finding sheep that are going to produce right. even enough for a small family. Yeah. Um, than you are goats or a cow. I am going to say about the sheep though, if you don't like the taste of goat's milk, mm -hmm. but you can't drink cow's milk, the, the sheep, in my experience, they tasted exactly oh, they, like they cow's They were milk. excellent. We had some dairy sheep for mm -hmm. just a season. Right. And they just didn't produce enough for us. We weren't set up well for them. Yeah, but they are out there, and the milk was excellent. The milk very, was amazing. Very, very we good were milk. having it in lattes, yeah. and it was great. So, so if you're wanting a small-scale solution, yeah. and you don't think you like goat milk, or you don't even need as much as some of the dairy goats, you can find sheep bread for milking out okay. there. That's probably going to be a little more challenging, depending on your location, but they are out there. What, what do you mean by small scale? Like how much milk were we getting when we were milking, per sheep, when we were milking every day? Oh gosh, well that, that's not a good true representation because that was couple really ad hoc. We were getting a couple of cups couple a of day. A couple of cups a day. But that's not, if you're getting into milking sheep, that's we not standard. We were optimizing it. We were yeah. not optimizing yeah. at all. We had a new milker, Tristan, he was, this was five years ago. Yeah. Uh, he was hand milking, tied to the fence. Yeah. So we definitely, definitely wasn't optimized. We decided that for us to work, we would need at least like five or six dairy sheep, and would probably need a mechanical milker and yeah. to have to have a real system to work for us. We just yeah. decided that wasn't it wasn't a system that worked well for us. But it is an option that's out there, so that's why we bring it up right. for people that maybe can't, don't want dairy milk, don't like goat's milk. You you do have that option. Yeah. And you could always milk rabbits <laughs> if you really want to go small scale okay so we're getting about six <laughs> gallons from the jersey cow we're talking a couple cups to maybe if you really had that optimized half a gallon a day from a sheep that would be on the high end for a sheep so when we're talking about a goat you're talking usually between about a gallon or two a day right. for a goat and the two gallons is definitely the high side of a goat and the rabbit so, was a joke and the rabbit Don't was take a me joke seriously go for the water buffalo first not poop, though not i've the heard rabbit. of somebody doing this <laughs> <laughs> so okay all right so into dairying a little bit into yes. a dairy cow a little bit okay. so you you covered a couple of the basics the volume that we get mm -hmm. and if you're going to have a dairy cow that's definitely a large commitment you need hopefully some pasture yes. people do it with just hay feeding and um a smaller pen not our favorite way to do things mm -hmm. really i'd really encourage you to have a little bit of land and, and some grass for the cow to be on yeah that that really increases the health yeah. um quotient of the milk that comes in if you have them out on the fresh spring grass that's just going to be your healthiest milk that is possible well and you want the cow to be a cow you want yeah. her to enjoy life and and honestly you know a life in a horse stall is just no life for a cow right um so you want to try not to do that at okay. least not for a long period of time so do you want to talk a little bit about what to how, how we choose a dairy cow yeah, we can talk about what we look for. A there's dairy a, there's cow. some Let's real myths some out there and, and romanticism too. about the, the dairy cow <laughs> and this 
sweet, picture perfect animal that everybody hugs on and loves and, and gives all the clean milk in the world and it's happily ever after. <laughs> We've had just about every variation of this possible, I think, in the different milk cows that we have owned. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you just, nothing's perfect. That's well, you know, you spend, Nobody's you perfect. spend <laughs> a lot of time with a dairy cow. You do. And you get to know her. And I've come to the conclusion that there's just a lot of similarities between them and us and people. <laughs> and one of the big ones is we've all got personalities. And we've all got our good traits and we've all got our things that we do well at that, that other people can enjoy. And we all have our traits that, um, you know, are hard to deal with. And dairy and we cows. we all have bad days. And we all have bad <laughs> days. Dairy cows are the exact same. Yeah. And to give you, for instance, talk about the two last cows we've had, our current mm -hmm. cow and then our favorite that we had for a long time that mm -hmm. uh, we, we no longer have. And, and you want to. Well, right now we have Molly, and she is probably the sweetest cow that we have. She ever is had. that picture perfect, is. nice family cow. She wants to be scratched and pet, and she, she will eat out of your well. hand. Yeah, you can lead her across the yep. yard and everything. She's just a sweet cow until you get her in the stanchion. And she is kind of a mess in the stanchion. She's like, yeah, not not personality wise. She's just no, got she's some sweet. issues she just being does milked. Not stand. She doesn't well. stand well. She mm -hmm. kicks, moves, and we're working on that. There's things you can do. We're not going to go into that to help yeah. bring her along. And we knew that. We knew that a little bit when we bought her. Mm -hmm. And um, but she's a good producer. Yeah. And wonderful cow. So that's one side of the story. Now, Bossy. Bossy, we had before that, and Bossy was not a very friendly cow. She was not. A, a nice cow, as in personality. Matter of fact, last she, time we moved her, she charged. We had some young guys helping because they were moving our beef cattle. She charged them like a bull. Oh, she put her head down and started throwing dirt yeah. over her back, pawing, just like those cartoons of Ferdinand the Bull. Like, And then she put her head down, and she ran after these guys. And they were all young cowboys, so they jumped behind trees laughing. <laughs> but, you know, she, she definitely had an attitude. Oh, yeah. But you put her in the stanchion, and... She was bomb-proof. She, she could do it. The kids milked her. The cats would climb she, up uh, her. She'd stand there for an hour and a half. The rooster would jump well, on her all back. The kids were learning. And she just would stand so yeah. still. She was a great cow. So you just have to know you're getting a whole other character when you get into a milk And cow. you want to try to know what you're getting into. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I'd take the cow that stands in the milking stanchion because that's where we're spending our time close to her. Mm -hmm. um, the, we need the milk, obviously. We don't mm -hmm. need kick buckets and, and dirty milk. So... Um, but you, what's important is to know what you're getting into, to do the best you can to find out that animal and how that's going to be working with that animal yeah. and what you can deal with. We have our own personalities. We're good at dealing with some things, not good at dealing with other things. Right. So you want to try to match that up. It's, it's not marriage, but it's close. <laughs> <laughs> you spend an awful lot of time with you that do. <laughs> You do. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you want to be able to get along with them. You want to be able to deal with their faults. And, yeah. Yeah, and um, so that's that's on, on that side of things, that's really important. Okay, so we're, we are actually getting kind of tight on time, but I know there's a lot of practical questions people who don't have any experience with milk cows are going to have. So I'm just going to fire them at you fast. Cool. Right. Give me fast answers. How long does it take to milk a cow at a time? By hand. J just the milking. Just the milking. Okay, and we milk by hand. We're not doing a machine, mm -hmm. and we should just do a quickie on that as to mm -hmm. why. But... Um, if everything's going well and I'm milking and, and she's got, you know, three to four gallons in her, I can milk her out in about 20 minutes to half an hour. 20 minutes that, to that, half an hour. That's really, okay, that's really good. Okay, faster answers. We're, we're cutting right, up okay, the chat. Right, shoot, okay, we're shoot. going fast. Okay. Um, why do you milk by hand and not a machine? For us, for milking one cow, milking by hand is just simpler. When you get into a machine, you have a lot of other things that you have to manage. And so... Um, it seems simpler than milking by hand and you don't have to do all the hand work, but you then have to take care of the machine It's a lot more to clean that has to be done really really well mm -hmm. some good stainless steel buckets mm -hmm. And my hands are a simple system mm -hmm. and the kids can maintain that system better as well um, As they're doing it because they do a lot of the milking than try the technicalities of a machine mm -hmm. okay. If we went up to two a day two cows two a day. cows a day, which yeah. we may do at some point we've large family got a lot of people here and, and we may We've tried try it that. before but 12 gallons a day is too much we didn't when we weren't set up for it yeah. so there may be a time but as you go up machine milking is definitely going to come in there and be more efficient but for one cow i would say hand milking is just more efficient we don't do good at short answers 
just so you know. No. <laughs> what is the youngest age that you start kids milking on a cow? Oh, oh gosh. Nine, ten, somewhere in there is the youngest we've started, but we have some probably in the next year or two that will start a little bit earlier. Okay. Yeah. What is the, um, the overall time commitment for the daily care of the cow outside of milking, not the milking time? Not including the milking not time. Not including the milking time. That's going to depend somewhat on your setup, but at least an hour a day. At least an hour a day. Okay, yeah. so you're talking, if you're milking twice a day, you're talking a minimum of two hours a day to care for the cow and milk. Yeah, if okay. you're milking twice a day and you're bringing her back and forth, pasture, whatever, yeah, two hours a day. Okay. Yeah. Um, what am I not hitting? You got any? Uh, well, I, I'd throw it back the other way and say, okay, so that we get that milk inside. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that affects the kitchen mm -hmm. and affects your day if things don't go well out here. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, how do you handle the milk coming in All right. and that volume of milk? Because you've got to prep it to skim for butter, which mm -hmm. can't happen okay. right away. So I do, I get the milk in, somebody delivers a bucket of milk to the back door pail, to yep. me a pail of milk there you go and i i like using the half gallon jars so i have half gallon jars mm -hmm. clean all set up with a filter and a funnel and i pour the milk through that filter just to clean out anything that got into it from the barn uh, hay a uh, little bit of cow hair anything like that that's very normal and you just filter that right out so it doesn't sit in there and then I get those into the refrigerator and I have a separate milk refrigerator at this point just to hold the volume. And um, then we have a special program for washing the buckets to make sure they're really nice and clean. So that's kind of the way the inside goes of receiving the milk. So how long does that take you outside of say butter and cheese production, just receiving the milk, maintaining that system? So we've got twice a day yeah. milking, two hours outside. Uh, for That's for one person. That, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd say 15 minutes to do the filtering and then the washing up afterwards. So half an hour a day. Half an hour a day of okay. that. Yeah, I've got okay. that. And then I've, I daily skim the milk, the cream, off the milk from the week before. Right. And that takes 10 to 15 minutes a day. And I only do that once a day. Right. So, um, and then, you know, you get into butter production mm -hmm. and into cheese production. Of course, the, both of those things, the time commitment goes way up. Those can be long or shorter depending on how you're doing it all. So you can see it is a major time commitment. But on the other hand, it also works out pretty well economically for the product. Well, and I was just going to say to wrap this up, let's just talk about the profitability of a milk cow. To a lot of folks out there, they're going to go, wow, that is a lot of time. It is. Spent. It's a lot of time. And, and a lot of commitment. Yeah. And it is. But the dairy cow... Uh, from our experience over years, crunching numbers, uh, if you have the resources to have a dairy cow, she's the second most productive asset as far as food mm -hmm. production on a farm uh, that you can have for time in. First would be the garden right? for us. Yeah. Um, uh, dairy cow produces so much for you that the value is, is solidly there mm -hmm. in milk, butter, Cheese. cheese. She, she's a profitable animal yogurt. if you take advantage of the resources. Kefir, yogurt. Sour cream. Absolutely. And of course, some of those things get into even a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. But if you have a family that is trying to eat organically, mm -hmm. or at least as healthy as possible, we get as close to organic as we can, yeah. those products, just the milk alone, at what is a gallon of organic milk? At the here? grocery store right now, you can buy here a gallon of raw organic milk for, it's a half gallon, sorry, a half gallon for $8 a half gallon. So that's, that's 16, 16 gallons a day. $16 a gallon. a gallon. Right. And we're getting six gallons a day. Right, right. So you're, you're almost $100 a day in value on the couch. It doesn't cost us anywhere that. Yeah. And um, that's just a start. You start turning that into butter, cheese, cheese your yeah. value adding, and so she becomes very, very profitable and essential if you are trying to live a sustainable, healthy homestead life mm -hmm. where, you're, where you're providing what food for yourself you can. Uh, again, if you have the need for that level and, and the resources, those pieces all have to fit. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a lot of work, but it is a very rewarding project to take on. And, you know, you really form a relationship with your milk cow. So it becomes a very interesting 
you know, oh, every, you, you just get another yeah, character in your life. You do, and you have the cats at your feet waiting mm -hmm. for the milk, and that helps sustain them. Yep. And all the just coming and going. She really is part of the family. Yeah. So that's right. that's Daring in a nutshell from us in, in kind of a quick tour. Uh-huh. And uh, I'm sure we're going to have some questions, so throw those out there. Yep. And next week, what are we talking about? Meat chickens. Our meat chickens are about to arrive. We have 225 meat chickens yeah. about to show up for this year. Yep. And so we'll be talking about meat chickens. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. How we start them, our approach to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that right. sounds good. So uh, thanks for hanging out with us again. Don't forget to share, like, subscribe. Subscribe. Yeah. <laughs> All of the above. All of the above. <laughs> All right. And um, we will see you soon. Okay. Goodbye. Bye.